notion of, you know, not only a, a financial boost, but the, the sort of encouragement and the confidence that, that you know, the, the project that you've embarked on and that you've sunk so much of your, you know, your soul and, and your energy into doing as an artist is, you know, it, it has some traction with people and, and that you, you have an audience. And, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, having formerly sort of been a participant in the art world, not at a, in a gallery and now working at a gallery, um, you know, it, it's amazing to sort of see the, the moments of kind of joy and, and, and confidence that that can instill. Um, because, you know, it's, it's a lonely life in the studio at times, I think. Um, and, you know, of course, artists are such a vibrant part of, they are, I mean, they are this community. And, um, so it, it is wonderful to be able to, to be a part of that. And, uh, you know, I think at any kind of level and participation in the art world, you know, you can see that and experience that. But I think especially at the sort of emerging level, there's a, something distinct there. I think one of the things, too, that um, excites me, to, uh, you know, sort of to dovetail what Ace is saying is, you know, we take sort of the linkages between what our artists are doing uh, to different kinds of disciplines, but also, of course, art history really seriously. And so um, it's a really exciting thing when you um, can kind of look at artists' ideas, even if they're really emerging, even if they're still in an MFA program, even if the work is really crude, if you can't really sort of totally glean all of the content from the sort of manifestation of the object, it's it's exciting to be able to kind of find these places where their thoughts and their intentions can kind of fit in. And those people who we support through the gallery and collectors support by acquiring the work, you know, those ideas become that more just that much more distilled and those dialogues and sort of linearities between you know different moments in history and across different cultures is sort of all gel and sort of that speaks back to the community part of it right because you're just you're creating community not only like within the sort of nuclear sense within the gallery but also sort of across across time and place too and um we also as a collector, when you're collecting emerging artists, then you can visit them in their galleries, which is quite exciting, and hear exactly from or hear from them about what they're looking to do, and 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 have those conversations. Um, I think it's also nice to see. I would imagine that when you have, for instance, a gallery opening, that you have a lot of your artists who are not a part of that opening coming to support their 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 colleagues in, in this world. Um, and so, again, it's this community, which is really special. And, and I think um, it's also nice to, to include in this community, for instance, the, the museums that are in your um, area and sometimes supporting these young artists and how you can be a part of, of that activity as well, um, which, again, um, is part of this ecosystem, is part of um, being supportive being a part of this exciting art community. And I think too, um, you know, this notion of, of stewardship, you know, when, when you're supporting young artists and when you're acquiring the work, you know, there will come a time when they're no longer an emerging artist and they're an artist that museums are interested in and they're an artist who, whose work you're asked to loan to a show at, you know, a Kunsthalle in, in you know, Dusseldorf and you know it, it'll be this sort of notion of sacrificing you know convenience or you know living with the work temporarily um or not temporarily um for the good of of the artwork and the artist and um you know I'd be curious to hear from you Stephanie because you know as you said you've been collecting for 35 years and um you know some of the artists that you know you walked around Soho looking at in you know 1985 they're you know that they're uh no longer uh you know, eating beans out of the can. And, um, you know, I'd be curious to hear how, you know, that kind of progress, you know, in their careers has been for you to watch and participate in. So I've had, we have across the board, we have some artists that one has never heard about since that we bought them. And then we have artists that are having museum exhibition shows all over and highly desired by collectors and, um, so we really um, was, didn't, haven't sold and really kept on to our things, um, happily lending out to museums. Um, we had a very young artist that I bought recently um, that was, um, 
exhibited in Prague at the National Museum in Prague. So that was fun. I went to Prague two weeks ago to look at the work on the wall and meet with the director and, and hear about the show. So uh, that was a great experience. And when we were rehearsing this, I told another experience um, that we had that we had one artist's uh, work who might not have fit so well into um, the whole collection and noticing that the prices were, were getting higher and higher. So we went to the gallery that we purchased it from, which is what one should try and do, and asked if they wanted to, if he wanted to buy it back. And when he said, of course, I want to buy it back, and he gave me a number, it kind of didn't gel with what one could, was seeing with, with the auction. So I said, well, you know, look, we'd love to make this work, but I think we have to go down the auction route, which he completely understood. So we sent this painting to Hong Kong because that was the best route for selling this work by this artist. When it arrived in Hong Kong, it was um, put in, in the online catalog. And then um, we got a message from the auction house that the archive for this artist, the artist is still living, noticed that there was um, some inherent damage caused by the the white paint that he had used to paint this painting in 2008, and it wasn't correct, and we needed to pull it from the auction and have it restored before we would sell it. We should sell it again. Some people could say, I don't really care and sell it as it is, but I wanted to do right by the artist. So we sent that painting from Hong Kong to Berlin, um, and to the restorer that was directed by the artist in the gallery. Um, the painting was restored in Berlin for another amount of money. And then um, happily, the auction house said, well, we could also sell this work in London. So I didn't have to send it back to Hong Kong. So we sent, we sent, I sent the work to London. It sold just now at the beginning of March. Um, it was very exciting. It did almost twice over the high estimate. And um, at the end of the day, it, 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 everybody, I was happy and we, I felt like I did the right thing. Um, but it was, it was, um, you know, it was a little nerve wracking at times. And, um, and, but, but, I, you know, every, it was a good experience. And, and again, I, I was happy to kind of service the artist um, correctly as I felt like I did. It's interesting to think about experiences like that, that then sort of uh, you you could then roll perhaps some of that money back into more acquisitions. So um, I guess my the sort of sort of nutshell of what I imagined this talk to be was to sort of think about how, you know, the longer you look at art, the more critical your eye gets, the more you understand what your own collection is and how your own taste operates on an intellectual level, but also a sort of emotional and sort of visceral level like how you continue to look at work that is emerging, that is young, that's rel relatively unknown within the sort of, you know, I'm hesitant to use the word canon, but like the canon of your own collection kind of, because um, I think that's something that we think a lot about as a young gallery, sort of how to situate our artists who have, you know, relatively little track record in terms of a broader public audience um, with collectors who have been, quite frankly, they're just looking at art for much longer than, you know, we have, or perhaps we've, you know, been here. <laughs> well, I, I, I think, again, it's, it's kind of really, it's really fun and refreshing to be able to um, walk into the gallery and, and see the friends that we trust and um, look at art through your eyes because you're out there in your own way looking at art and, um, and then kind of take this like leap of faith um, with you, with the artist, and and feel good about that. But again, it's always about buying what you like. I mean, that's the number one um, rule in my book. And um, and so I think again, the more that you look and look and hone your eye, then you know what you like um, much more quickly. I'll take it. Um, so I guess to give you all a little background, the gallery um, will be nine years old in July. 
Um, my partner, Adam, is also an artist. Um, and so when we first became friends, but then eventually partnered in the gallery, um, you know, he is a classically trained violinist. He's played the violin since he was four. Um, this idea of practice and technical rigor for him had a very specific definition that was grounded in classical music. Um, and I, you know, I studied art history in, in undergrad as well as photography. Um, but my art history sort of deep dive was sort of, um, you know, it started in like 1972, like conceptualists forward. Um, and so we had a real sort of, he would say debate, I would say negotiation as to sort of what made sense to be the core of our program. Um, and sort of how we first started choosing our artists sort of were, were uh, um, artists that uh, thought rigorously, both sort of conceptually and materially. So, um, you know, artists that were emerging that sort of cared deeply about the materiality of what they were doing. Not using the wrong white paint on a painting to perhaps cause it later damage would be a very easy way of describing something that we, you know, would sort of stay clear of avoiding. But really, sort of this very sort of thin, you know, Venn diagram of um, artists who care deeply about both. We also care a tremendously about an object's ability to communicate something to anyone. So it doesn't have to be um, expressly what the artist's intention was, but we love objects that can um, at least ask questions of anyone asking them. Children, people who have been looking at their, at their whole lives, you know, and everybody's sort of in between. And that um, perhaps sounds a little basic, but um, that is really, the, the generosity of the art object is very important to us. Also, um, personality. Like until 2020, we were a two person shop and it was just the two of us managing everybody and also doing all the other aspects of the whole business. And so, um, you know, we really, it was really important to us that our artists sort of um, loved that part of what we were trying to do, that we're trying to grow into, you know, a world class business, a world class institution. Um, but that we were starting very much at the ground level and everybody kind of had to play their part. Um, and that personality type is actually pretty rare. I think one of the best nuggets of advice that I got from a, a, a sort of famous artist that is a professor at UCLA and actually taught several of the artists that we work with in the gallery is that sort of the best thing you can hope for as a, as a gallerist is for all of your artists to feel sort of in healthy competition with one another, right? That everyone who puts a show up feels like it's their responsibility to have it be the best show you've ever done. And that is, uh, a, you know, not a light task. It's not a light responsibility. And so um, you sort of kind of, over time, you sort of get the vibe if people are sort of down for that or not. But we don't, I mean, we obviously, you're looking in this room, we show work across all different media, painting, sculpture, photography, video, uh, you know, so it's not bound by a medium or sort of a, an approach, but rather sort of more of an ethos. Or sex? Certainly not sex, certainly not, you know, any other sort of defining identity. Uh, well, notion. I wanted to say sort of on the, on the kind of to go back to what we were talking about in terms of community on a sort of practical level, I think almost all of our artists sort of since the beginning kind of nucleus of the program have sort of led to one another. Um, and that can be both on a literal level, like you got to see my friend who we, who I went to graduate school with. I didn't even, or even forget friend. I didn't even know this guy in graduate school, but he's fantastic. And I need you to check him out. And would you do a studio visit? And, you know, then that person might say, you know, I did a residency and, you know, this, this artist was unbelievable. And, you know, you'd be remiss not to, you know, check out the work. And, you know, it, it, it's sort of, you know, when you kind of surround yourself, I think with the artists who sort of, you know, eat, sleep and breathe the same kind of ethos and the same kind of commitment to the work that you do as a gallery, it's sort of the, the pieces very naturally fill in. And, um, you know, I've, I've found it, you know, as Meredith said, the gallery has been around nine years. I've been here for two of them. Um, you know, I, I've found that the way that the artists sort of have a feeling of agency and responsibility almost, for, you know, feel so deeply part of the community to the point that, you know, artists that we show, you know, deeply matter to them and they consider that the context of their work in a really serious way, uh, I, I think speaks to the success of 
of what Meredith and Adam were, were, you know, able to accomplish, which was to build this sort of community that, you know, has, you know, serious criticality and self-criticality, which I think is uh, extremely important. Yeah, well. some of our artists are now our best collectors. They all want each other's work, which was yeah. not a, a circumstance that a we ever, sign, we ever yeah. expected, but yeah. that's been really cool to, yeah. to watch. Yeah. Should we talk a little bit about maybe like Kyle Staver, who's not like a young artist? True. And, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So Kyle Staver, who did that wonderful Venus and the Octopus painting right now. By the way, she has an opening going on right now in New York um, at a gallery. Um, Kyle, in the first studio visit that Meredith and Adam ever had with Eleanor Swarty, who did the drawing of the person folding a shirt and putting it away in a drawer just over on that wall there, um, Eleanor said, you know, if there's one painter that, you know, I think about and that has been sort of instrumental to my career um, or to, not to my career, to my development as a painter and to what I how I've sort of honed my eye and, and my heart towards painting, it's Kyle Staver. And, you know, that that sort of, you know, it was probably what, five, six years later that. Right. That we actually sort of got to know Kyle and we reached out to Kyle and and, uh, you know, she's got a show now opening at the gallery next month at our gallery in L.A. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's the sort of and but what Stephanie, I think, was getting at, too, um, was that Kyle uh, just turned 70 years old um, this week. And she, you know, has been making paintings in New York for something 40 years um, to sort of, you know, had an enormously warm reception from other artists and and critics and audiences. Um, but, you know, there's not been that sort of market splash that sort of, for better or worse, kind of takes an artist from the emerging category to the emerged category or the blue chip category or wherever you want to categorize that. Um, and so, you know, when we define our, or when we consider ourselves an emerging gallery, I think, you know, that, you know, it, it is a sort of arbitrary thing because I think, you know, Kyle has been this enormously influential painter on a generation of people now who, you know, she sort of, who feel that she's given them a, a permission to make sort of these figurative paintings where, you know, this woman is rising out from the clutches of an octopus. And, and, you know, when she was doing that, starting doing that in the seventies and eighties, it was, you know, totally, you know, sort of not what was happening and it wasn't the zeitgeist. And, and then, you know, of course, there's this sort of corrective lens that gets applied retroactively. And suddenly, you know, she's this incredible painter's painter who has been, you know, enormously uh, important. Um, and so I think that can be a function of an emerging gallery, too. Um, it, it can be, you know, an, an avenue to sort of reappraise artists uh, for whom, you know, it, it um, you know, who sorely need it, perhaps. I also, I always watch on my little emails and I, there's always, I always get excited and I've been collecting a long time and I still, every time I look at your emails, I'm like, oh wow, this is really cool. But there, I, I feel that I came in here tonight and there's such a consistency. Um, there's a thread that goes through it. I don't know what it is, but I feel it. So if you could explain more about your artists and and what is that consistency because there is something here. So we thought about anytime we show work by multiple artists that are in our program, we think about it as you know some some degree of an exhibition, right? Um, and I think one of the things that you're responding to Jill is the sort of um, the like object hood of everything. Like there is a real sense that everything about every object that we show, but that's in this room as well, is extremely considered. Whether it be you know the artist's choices, composition, form, color, line, whatever, to finishing, framing, you know how we put things in context with one another, how we chose to some to separate, you know, some 
artists works from one another versus like grouping them you know um i think that we we really i think care about the way that the objects present and in a way that goes back to that sort of lack of interest in, in alienating anyone looking at anything ever you know we want we want the works to feel accessible at the highest level and also at you know people who are new to looking at work um I think I can talk a lot about process too. I mean, every artist that we work with really is dedicated to their process in whatever way that manifests. Um, again, the material choices are really sound, they're really specific, they're really intentional to the work. Um, I think the consistency just is is that shared ethos that everyone sort of comes from and it's getting more and more distilled. The longer we do it, like even we put everything up in the room and we were like, oh wow, like this sort of suits, you know? And we did make some, you know, choices like to bounce your eye around the room. Like there's turquoise there, there's turquoise there, there's turquoise there. Like those choices were intentional, you know. Um, there's a lot more orange than I expected, but there's a lot of orange as well. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, does that answer your question? No, <laughs> not all of it. Um, I don't know. Do you want to take a stab at answering it? Sure. Um, you know, I think, Jill, part of what you said or, you know, part of, I think, the nature of that question is that, you know, you look around the room and I think, you know, a lot of galleries, um, you know, you can sort of get a sense for like the taste of two or three specific people. And by extension, you know, the taste of the 12 people that they hope to sell art to and the four curators they hope to engage. And, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, really sort of drew me to Adam and Meredith when I was first getting to know them um, was that they really don't sort of make prescriptions when it comes to taste or when it comes to, you know, ideas of aesthetically speaking or, you know, formally speaking necessarily, like, what is a good painting, you know, because I think there would be people for whom Kyle's painting is, you know, a sort of a, a pinnacle of what a painting should be. And then, you know, Kylie White might, you know, have a sort of different definition of what a successful art object is or what it does. Um, and I think, you know, part of what makes, you know, our program um, sort of gel and, and all sort of work together is that I think, you know, the artists are sort of pursuing their own kind of uh, their own thread and their own kind of rabbit hole of, of you know, what, what is my work about and, you know, what questions does my work ask of me? Does my work ask of the viewer? And whether or not the work, you know, endeavors to answer those questions, um, you know, there's this sense that, you know, the work is sort of accountable, you know, back to that thing of accountability, sort of accountable to itself and accountable, you know, maybe to the sort of parameters that it, you know, purports and, and speaks to existing within. Um, and I think that's really important uh, for us and for our artists and you know, I, I hope that that translates, um, you know, when people come to our shows in, in L.A. and when we do fairs, um, you know, this idea that, you know, something is is being said and that that can be heard and understood through the work. Um, and, you know, that the work carries meaning and, and that the work, um, you know, is is going somewhere and uh, in, in that somewhere is often, you know, very different artist to artist. And, so and I hope that answers your question. At least partially. Totally. <laughs> well, I... No, no, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think there's an important distinction. Um, you know, we, before any artist, whether we've, you know, shown them for nine years or we're planning a first show and because of COVID, we've only spoken to them over the phone or whatever, um, you know, there isn't some sort of like, you know, you always have to read for the part, maybe, you know, I'll say that, you know, there, there's not this kind of, oh, you want to do a show? Do a show. You know, there's immense kind of, you know, weight behind doing a show, I think. Um, and, you know, we, we really, you know, uh, 
kind of hold our artists to, you know, a, a standard that they, of course, hold themselves to and that they hold us to as a gallery. Um, and it is, you know, I mean, you know, Meredith is probably a better person to answer this than me because she's been, you know, supporting artists and making them feel, you know, enormously supported for so many years um, that, um, yeah, it, it, it's a, uh, it's a mutual thing. You know, I think we absolutely do support artists and, and we feel that returned back to us with the seriousness with which they approach uh, showing at the gallery and, and making work that they intend for shows at the gallery. I worked for an artist. My first job out of college was working in an artist studio as a studio manager. And one of the things that I learned from her was sort of the accountability of that 50%, right? To your point, like no one else takes 50% from sort of like an agent client relationship, right? Like in Hollywood, it's like everybody gets 10. Agent gets 10, manager gets 10, public gets 10, lawyer gets 10, et cetera. Um, and, you know, a lot goes into earning that 50% in addition to sort of the general overhead of the gallery. And I think one of the things that has distinguished us um, as a young gallery um, is our willingness to do crazy things for our artists in service to making sure that they feel um, empowered to make the work they want to make. And it turns out that when artists that we're interested in in any way feel buoyed by that support, that they don't want to make the same octopus painting over and over again, that they want to sort of follow different threads and do different things. And I think that that makes for the most exciting conversation. Um, so, you know, given our, you know, relative to our limited resources, what we will, are willing to do is, um, you know, off the charts. And I'd, I'd like to ask you, Stephanie, and perhaps you were just going to uh, <laughs> uh, uh, intercept my question and know what was coming, but, you know, uh, we say, you know, we support, support, support. There's no supporting artists without, you know, wonderful collectors who, who, you know, understand that, you know, making art is a lifelong, uh, you know, life. It's a life. It's a life. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd be curious to hear how, you know, you've continued your support of artists. Um, and not only, of course, as you know, by buying the work, but by supporting the work, what that means to you. Um, one of the things that I was going to say, and some of you are already preaching to the converted, but is to find, is to do find the gallery who is showing works that you like at, at the beginning of, of a gallery career, beginning of an artist career, and then keep with that gallery. They, they've kind of vetted the art for you. Um, and you, in your supporting of the gallery and the artists, then you continue to have this relationship as the gallery moves on, as the artist moves on, um, we all know that you know some artists become very hot. It's hard to get them. When you have the gallery that you've been supporting, you often can get to more of the top of the list. Um, so maybe you've been buying, you know, Artist Smith, and um, and and that gets hot, and then you buy some another artist, and that could become hot. But then you want this other artist, and that's hot. But you know just that's just how all of this works so um so that was what i was going to also contribute to kind of trying to be there at, at the beginning um and and then in addition to supporting by buying um you're su you're supporting even by showing up i think that that's really important um sometimes artists galleries need help with a, a, a catalog right so you know, help to support a catalog or again, to lend, lend to a museum exhibition, to have others, to talk to others about what you're doing, introduce them to the gallery program. I guess, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about my, my family's involvement in all of this. So um, my, my son is very, very passionate and working in the art world and, and my daughter loves it as well. But, um, you know, it can, it's this lifelong um, experience that we we've all had and 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 shared and and it's been um, you know really a, a treasure. So um, that's for a microphone. I can't use. Okay, Crystal. way 
but it's really like awesome. awesome. It incentivizes the ascent to use your studio, your gallery, rather than someone else's based on the amount of push they're going to get, the resources that they're going to have. So all the artists that we work with, that we represent, we have long-term relationships with. So, and we don't enter into new relationships with new artists unless we anticipate that they're going to be long-term. Of course, circumstances happen, you know, um, I can can't count on, you know, less than two fingers, you know, that I've parted ways with an artist after thinking that, you know, we were going to sort of work together long-term. But in general, um, we've had a check-in, nobody checks out policy. Or at least a trend. Yeah, not a policy, it's a, yeah, an experience, you know, they don't. behind you but it's okay I keep thinking um, broken friends or uh, taking you back to the 60s or a little bit of pop can you do that at all in Minneapolis or can you tell me a little bit about that artist first sure so this is Franziska Guz um, and in fact, she has the distinction here among this group of being the only artist uh, who we don't actually technically represent. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. No, 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 no. What I, all I mean by that is that is we only just started working with Franziska. She, she currently has a show up at the gallery. Uh, we met her um, fairly recently and have sort of all fallen in love and uh, perhaps You'll see her on that little card that says all of our artists uh, next time we print one. Um, but yes, I'll tell you about the painting. So Franziska, um, in this painting and in all of the paintings since you know we've started working with her that she's made over the past few years, um, she has sort of, and this is a very German kind of approach in my mind, and she is based in Berlin and she's a professor of painting there. Um, she at the outset of the painting, picks five or six colors, uh, and it's acrylic paint, and she picks five or six colors, and over the course of the painting, and she only works on one painting at a time, doesn't deviate from them and doesn't mix them. She mixes them optically, but she won't blend them into a sixth, seventh, eighth, fortieth color. Uh, she sort of works out, you know, how can I kind of wring out, you know, all of the kind of formal and, and material possibilities in these colors um, and in these kind of forms that she's chosen. I mean, you'll see there's, it's sort of defined by the kind of formal echoes, you know, the sort of flag shapes and the circles and the rectangles that kind of bounce around. And I think, you know, her paintings um, maybe have, have slightly more to do, uh, Ellen, with, um, you know, maybe a sort of post kind of abstract expressionist moment and the, this kind of idea of, uh, you know, how, how do you kind of, make a painting that has, you know, quote unquote, sort of heat and, and feeling and there's sort of inertia behind it. But at the same time, that's sort of, you know, I mean, that's kind of that whole idea has been sort of looked at recently with, you know, somewhat of a skeptical glance, because I think, you know, there's a certain, um, you know, th there's a certain sort of measuredness to it, too. And, you know, that's not something that you would maybe associate with these kind of brushy you know, wilder passages, but then of course you see that they're kind of boxed in. Um, and I think it's this sort of idea of, you know, what kind of, uh, what kind of you can get out of very kind of limited self-imposed parameters. Yeah. I would say similar to pop, it's sort of limited in its expression, right? It's like, it is expressive. It is telling you something and it is, um, sort of like, wildly intuitive where it's intuitive but it's also extremely deliberate in how it's being expressive which is not dissimilar to alexa for instance you know um and even to some extent kyle although kyle is much more of like a painter's painter um in a way that sort of becomes materially impossible to be that deliberate i suppose but deliberate is sort of a big thing uh in our in our uh shop um, you know, I think you can, for better or worse, maybe get a lot, get away with a lot, uh, in art. I mean, Andy Warhol said art is what you can get away with. Uh, and I think he sort of had a, you know, that was sort of a glib statement on his part, but I think it's been taken a little too liberally by 
by some. And, you know, I think it's really important to us that there is sort of clarity on on everyone's part um, about, you know, and that doesn't mean, again, that, you know, this means this and this and that means that, but more that, you know, there's there's something being said and, and you know, the artwork should should say it. Um, and so, yeah. Um, and I want to thank Jill because Jill introduced me to Meredith and Ace, who introduced me to Stephanie. And I want to stay, uh, really thank the Studio 1608 space, all the artists that are also here. Um, they've been beyond gracious, welcoming this programming here, taking over their public space. Um, so thank you again. And I really want to thank all of you for um, really embracing this experiment. When I said to Jill, this is what I think I want to do down here. And she's like, cool. Okay. She brought toilet paper and a hammer and for a show we hung together. So um, thank you all for your support. Really appreciate it. And those that are going to table 26, you know where it is. And if you have any questions while you've got everybody here, feel free to ask privately. We're here all night. You're all We're night. Here. <laughs> We're here for a few weeks too. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Wait. Oh, Oh, you don't need it? Okay, Jerry doesn't need it. I've been collecting for a long time. <laughs> what is the difference to, between 40 years ago, 30 years ago, and today? Forty, thirty, forty 30, 40 years ago in the 70s and the 80s compared to today? I think I, well, I've only been around a little less than, than three decades, but I think, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about it, and I, I, think, um, I think there's maybe two big differences, and I want to hear what Stephanie has to say, but I think the art world has expanded enormously in size. Um, in every way, uh, and I think the way that art can reach viewers, those channels have expanded and multiplied. Uh, that would be my answer. I would dove I would dovetail on that by just saying that I mean my sort of basic answer is the internet. To Ace's point, I mean the internet, as we all know, sort of causes information glut or information sort of overload, and so there's just more available to more people to look at more often than there ever has been ever in history. And there's more people to potentially contact to try and get it. And that makes it so that, um, at least from my perspective, um, it is both easier to buy art, but harder to figure out what you actually like about collecting it. Because if you're just buying it all the time, you're not actually necessarily thinking about it in the way that you might have 40 years ago, 30 years ago, because you had to call someone and talk to them about something. You know, you had to go somewhere physically and see something in person and have a conversation with someone. And those conversations you had would bring you back the next Saturday and the Saturday after that. And those relationships, those conversations would become relationships. And then you would only ever call that person for that thing, you know? So that is so different and causes a lot of, I think, confusion um, potentially among our generation of, 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 you know, young people just starting to think about collecting. I think I think years ago it was a lot more interesting and a lot more fun. And, a, and when you went to look at it, you had to go to the gallery. You had to study it. Today, everything is a hype. I'm, not everything, but a lot of things are hype. Just based on our sort of personality, as well as our artists, as well as our sort of sensitivity to what we're doing and the real commitment that we have to what we're doing, um, we tr we do our very best to stave off sort of um, buyers that come to collecting art by way of speculation um, in general. 
Um, it's not great for the artist market. It's not great for their careers. It's not great for anyone's psychology. So we do what we can. Um, I think that we all, the three of us um, who run the gallery, we're all extremely capable. If we wanted to make a lot of money very quickly, we would all be doing something else. Um, but I, th in, in, in truth, um, but I think that, you know, but at the same time, we, we want everybody to, to make money, to live the life they want to live, for all the artists to end up sort of canonized and have the markets that they, that they want. Um, and so, you know, we try and navigate around it. But I, for us, I can only speak for us. I would like to think that most of the collectors that buy from us still buy because they love the work and they want, they want to see it appreciate in value and grow in importance and significance in every way, financially included. But that's not the first thing that brings them to buying a work of art from us. No one, we almost got, we almost, we almost got through. Um, <laughs> nobody yet has come to me with the interest in making like an artwork as an NFT. I, I think that goes back to just the way we, all of our artists are really grounded in like physical material. So, you know, no one has come to me and said, I, you know, I, I want to make this artwork as an NFT. Um, I am interested in the possibilities around NFTs as methods for authentication um, and sort of documentation of transference of ownership. You can use the blockchain and NFT technology to sort of track for the artist's career when an artwork changes hands. I think that could theoretically be an interesting application. I'm interested in learning about the companies that are doing that. There's a startup in San Francisco that one of our collectors is uh, working with who um, you know, is a, is a sort of an ex, it's an ex Christie's group of people who have interest in this primarily for collectors so that when they buy a work of art, it immediately shows up in, uh, in a, in a digital wallet, basically as a asset for better or for worse to use that word, but that's the word they use. Um, but at the end of an artist's career, a big plus to that is knowing where everything is, because that basically is like a, it's like a digital record of when things get bought and sold. Um, so whether or not artists, you know, retain resale royalties for future sales, which is a whole other conversation in and of itself, um, it would at least provide, you know, us as a representation and the artist's studio a means for knowing where any work of art ends up between transference for exhibitions down the line, for catalog resumes down the line, for so catalog res or catalog resumes go from costing, you know, a couple million dollars to, you know several hundred thousand for the production of the book because people don't have to spend the time, the research, the travel, finding works of art. It's all very clear. And that is, from my perspective, the best potential use of the technology. During our Basel by the argument that NFTs ultimately are a way for the artist to get a piece of the resale of the work. That, that it could be used as a way that once, that, I mean, the way the works now, you sell a, the piece you just sold without an NFT, the, the artist doesn't benefit, you did, but the artist doesn't. And I thought that was actually uh, the one most compelling reason uh, that resonated with me. I think it definitely is interesting. It's definitely compelling. Um, the behavioral shift to adopting that in practice will literally mean us all changing our notion of ownership of anything, right? Like when you sell a house, you don't expect to sell 10% to the last person that owned it or whatever, you know? And yes, and a work of art is an artist's, um, the, the artist retains the copyright, it's their intellectual property, um, but to actually adopt that in practice as an international behavior, I think is far more complex. Like, I'm an optimist. I would love for all of my artists to make 10% on every painting that ever gets sold into perpetuity. That would make everyone so happy and everyone to be able to buy homes in the next 10 years as opposed to 20. You know, it would be great. However, like, I think there's a reality in terms of the sort of time it will take for collectors to willingly adopt that behavioral change as well as for the technology to actually be implemented. People, I think, in all of the conversations I've had with all these startups that are trying to use NFT technologies in these certain ways that I'm talking about, they are all very transparent with 
everybody's talking a lot about NFTs. They're all talking like they know exactly what it is, how it works, how it's going to go, where it's going to go with a lot of authority. And nobody really knows like the implications of it. So I can't even really speak to authority with, with it at all. I just, I know that it, it is interesting, but I don't know how it's actually going to pan out. Well, I mean, I guess full disclosure is um, I bought an NFT. Fabulous. So, uh, um, and so I mentioned that my, my, I, my children are very much like involved in this world. So, um, you know, for, and, and my, my children, my son in particular is all about the paintings and the artists and, and the, the tactile and, and I mean, it's knows very well and 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 so the nft it wasn't that he just like walked into this and said i don't know anything about the art world but nfts are cool and all my friends are buying them and i want that that didn't that wasn't the case he came to it because a gallery that we work with had an artist who was making and selling nfts and so that's i mean from my perspective i said okay well we'll buy this because it came from the gallery that i trust like you asked, like, so if, if Meredith decided that they were going to work with one of their artists were making NFTs, then you would say, oh, well, maybe, right? So precisely, yeah. like if somebody that I work with closely came to me and said, you know, this idea is best, you know, conveyed vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. an NFT, I would say, you know, go for it and I'll figure it out and we'll do the right. research and we'll, we'll, right. we'll market it accordingly. And you'll, and and you'll, you'll sell it to your collectors because we'll they follow, they, follow that. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so, um, so I don't, I don't kind of really know what I bought. I mean, I have this screen and then you can turn it on and look at it. And, and I had cryptocurrency and that was a whole nother deal to pay for with the cryptocurrency. Oh my God. It was like, it was really difficult. Yeah. Because you can only buy like $5,000 worth of cryptocurrency at a time. And then you have to pass it along and you have to put on, you know, all of your details and so um, it, it's a process. I mean, it, it's fun and interesting and something to converse about. But, um, you know, I, I and I feel like I, I kind of feel like I can do it because I collect art and then I have one NFT. So that's kind of do you own physical work by the artist that made the NFT? No, no. He's just an NFT artist. Yeah. And, uh, oh. Yeah, please, please, please. So, yes, I bought crypto at one price, then it was, you know, this much cryptocurrency, and I think I paid more, more in dollars because my cryptocurrency went down. I mean, it's just what you do. Like, if you buy something in, in sterling, you, 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 run, you run the same risk, you know, with the exchange rate. It's I mean, the, crypto, the cryptocurrency market is just about as volatile as the emerging art market, right? It's like... And the international... And, and, and the internet, yeah. You know, uh, exchange, exchange rate. Exchange rate, yeah. yeah, it's... You know, I, I also think... Um, and, you know, I, again, I, I, I'm not necessarily, you know, uh, I, I, I feel I'm a sort of dispassionate observer of the whole NFT thing only because I think, you know, there is historical precedent for, um, you know, I, I bet at one point people said, you want me to pay what for a photograph uh, as a, you know, you can just rally though, you know, print those off. What do you mean? Oh, there's only five of them you made, for, you know, and, and or a, or a. VHS tape or a DVD or a video file. I mean, you know, I think how, you know, how, how the art gets to a person is both crucially important and constantly changing and evolving. The uh, big difference, though, with the NFT is that it, as an artwork, is it lies at the sort of nexus between two unregulated markets, right? The art market and the cryptocurrency market. So... <laughs> Maybe that's the place to. <laughs> so strap your your Sorry. hat on. You know you'll you'll lose it. <laughs> I don't know. I. Yeah. I think that once the sort of, yeah, that was exactly what I was going to say. I think that from my perspective, um, you know, we talk about the art world, the art world, the art world, but there are actually so many different art worlds, especially now. 
And um, I think of our gallery as something very specific, but the gallery down the street from me that is also, you know, started at a similar age, and, you know, theoretically on like a, a market sense on a spreadsheet, we could theoretically consider ourselves sort of competitors if you want to define it that way. But the ethos, the ethos, the sort of like sensitivities are totally different. And I think that my impression as well is that the NFT as artwork will just kind of become its own art world. Like it'll become its own thing that I will or will not participate in, depending on whether or not my artists are interested in it. It will either become a, a material like, you know, any other sort of digital media that can be made into artworks or not. But the sort of NFT market I think is my impression will sort of, it's like an iceberg. It'll just go its own way. Maybe, who knows? Well, that's, that's, that was the first thing I said when we started this sort of dialogue about NFTs, which is like that right now, because of who my artists are and what they've brought to me as being interested in the sort of NFT space. That is the only arena in which I am sort of actively thinking about the technology as a, as a means for authentication. Mm -hmm.